So hello, good morning everybody. Why don't you come in and take a seat if you haven't got one already. It is great to see you all this morning at this fresh time of 10.30. Why don't you give yourselves a round of applause for being here at 10.30. You are on time, thank you. We love to see you. Welcome, welcome. If this is your first time, it is great to have you here as well. Who had a donut? Put your hands up if you've had a donut. Yes. Donuts on Sunday are the greatest way to start the day. Great. <laughs> Grab a seat. I've just noticed these two dinosaurs down here. These are the cutest dinosaurs I've ever seen. Welcome, dinosaurs. Great to have you. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't talking about John and Jen, by the way, um, when I was talking about... No, that, yeah, there's... Easy, no, yeah, there's a line that would have crossed it. Um, we're grateful to have John and Jen here and the dinosaurs behind John and Jen as well. <laughs> you might also notice this week, here's another addition. You can see me this week. Way! We have lights on the stage. Um, and this is only, as you can see, they've wired in only half of the lights as well. Um, so every week this is moving forward, which I'm really excited for. But um, anyway, thanks for being here. Um, Online as well, welcome. Great to have you guys here. Um, I'm really expectant and excited this morning to spend time in God's presence with God's people, worshipping him together. And I'm really believing, I don't know how you've sort of walked into church this morning, but why not just take a moment now and centre yourself a little bit and fix your eyes on Jesus as we lead into worship. Whatever's been going on in your week, just shift your gaze, shift your perspective. Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. There is nothing in your life going on right now that he does not see, that he cannot intervene in. He cannot shift and change. And I'm just prayerful this morning, and I'm really believing. I've been following, I don't know if any of you have, um, this outpouring of the Spirit in Asbury in America, just a worship service that started about a week ago and hasn't stopped and it's driven by young people. Just young people have just now been worshipping God for a week straight. People coming and going, not getting much sleep. And God's spirit has just landed in that place. And I'm encouraged because I see the hunger there and I see the desire for God. But I'm also encouraged because that same spirit that is pouring out there is here this morning. That same spirit of transformation and worship and all of those things. So why don't you stand to your feet? I'm going to pray. And let's just um, enter into a time of worship together with humility, with expectancy, with joy, and let's believe that God's really going to move in this time. So Heavenly Father, we just honor you this morning. Lord, we worship you. We thank you for who you are. And Lord, you see every person in this place. You see where they're at. You see what's going on in their lives. You see them and you love them. You know them. And God, I just pray that you would encounter us this morning as we lift up your praises. We give you all the honor, all the glory. We fix our eyes upon you, Jesus. In your mighty name, amen. amen.
coming for this this morning, I really sense that um, God doesn't just want us to be like children who are listening to a story by a storyteller, but that he actually desires us to be children that come to the Father, to our Father, and press in and lean in, and lean into his lap, lean into his embrace. And I just sense that God wants to do that this morning. He wants to remind us of who he is. He's our Father. That he's the way maker. The reason I chose this song is because it speaks of who God is. He's a promise keeper. And I don't know where you're at in your life right now. But I need a promise keeper. And I need a way maker. And I want that to be my heart's desire every day. Like Ben just talked about those youth that are pressing in. I want to be a church that presses into Jesus because he's so worth pressing into. And I want to see people's hearts touched. I want to see lives mended, like fully mended.
foot of your cross now. This song speaks of when we don't see things happening, we know you're working. Father, we're going to sing this as a declaration right now. For those things to be rumbled in Jesus' name, those things to be crumbled at the foot of the cross, that we need a miracle. We need work. We need your work, Lord, not ours, Father. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working.
take away from today's service is that God's power is enough and he expresses his power through love so we just we stand in that today we are loved we are children of God and his power is enough for us amen Amen. awesome why don't you have a seat thank you worship team that was phenomenal Amazing. This Tuesday is Pancake Day. Praise the Lord. It's a, it's a big one in my diary. Um, it also means that um, on Wednesday, Lent begins. Now, I don't know how you, um, how you approach Lent. It's a, it's a time in the traditional Christian calendar that leads up to Easter. Often it's a time for many Christians choose to fast something over Lent For me, I've always found it's a great um, prompt or reminder to do a bit of a sort of, um, what's the word, a check on my spiritual life, to take a few weeks in the lead up to Easter as we then will celebrate Jesus's resurrection, to just sort of take stock a little bit, to see where I'm at with God. And I don't know what Lent looks like to you, but I would just encourage you if you need a prompt or if you need something to be like, actually, yeah, I've been thinking for a while, like I do want to push a bit deeper into God, or perhaps during worship today, as Amy was talking about hunger for God, like this cry for God, like Lent is a really good opportunity to do something like that. Fasting is incredibly powerful in drawing us closer to God, or even setting aside, say, you know what, during Lent, I'm just going to set some extra side of time, set some extra time aside. Here we are. It's early, 10.30 start to the service, um, to pray. Whatever it is, I would just encourage you, the, the traditional Christian calendar is useful to us because it constantly reminds us of the foundations of our faith throughout the year. And so if you've never embraced Lent before, let me encourage you, maybe do a bit of reading about it over the next couple of days and just have a think. And as Pancake Day hits on Tuesday and then Lent starts on Wednesday with Easter um, approximately however many weeks away, um, just use the time and say, God, 
I want to get to know you closer over this time. It's always a good prayer to pray. Um, so that's my little encouragement for you this morning. Some exciting news um, uh, for this morning. We have Samuel Klemperer with us this morning, who is our new youth leader. So um, I'm going to ask Samuel to come up here. Welcome, Samuel. This is Samuel. Um, So Samuel starts work officially on Tuesday, um, and we are so excited to have him here on the island um, as our youth leader and also helping out um, some of the kids' team with some of the coordination of kids' work as well. Um, We're really thrilled to have Samuel here. Um, And um, I thought just before he started um, on Tuesday... Um, It would be great to pray for him as a church and as a community. Um, So I'm going to invite um, Tim and Serena, if she's around, and John and Jen. Just get a few of these guys up to lead prayer for Samuel as he begins. Um, And I would just encourage you as a congregation, um, Tim's going to lead us in prayer in a moment, just to make Samuel feel as welcome as you guys have made Kelsey and I feel over this past year. Um, We've we've really experienced your love as a community since we arrived last March. And my prayer is that Samuel is going to experience the same from you guys. So get to know him, invite him for a coffee or lunch or whatever it is um, to get to know this incredible young man. um, And you're going to love him. But um, Tim, have you got a microphone or do you want this one? Um, But let's, um, let's pray for him. We'll pass it around. We'll pass it around. It's okay. Um, We're ready to pray. Um, I I just sensed God was speaking uh, before, and I was reading in 2 Corinthians, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power that belongs to God and not to us. And um, it struck me that the jars are like human fragility, okay? And knowledge of that leads to humility. But the treasure is your God-given identity, And knowledge of that leads to authority. And so I want to pray for this beautiful paradox to be in every aspect of your ministry. The paradox of empathy and wisdom. The paradox of servanthood and glory. The paradox of peace and sometimes chaos. The paradox of power and gentleness. The paradox of confidence and dependence. And um, so, Father, we pray in the light of 2 Corinthians... Um, Lord, that as Samuel brings everything that he is, that you'd fill him with everything that you are. Holy Spirit, that you'd equip him uh, for the tasks ahead. Lord, that you'd knit him into the team and into this family. Lord, that he'd feel welcome. Lord, that he'd feel part of this straight away. And Lord, we pray that he would uh, be equipped with everything he needs for this journey ahead, Lord, as part of this team in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, fill him with your presence and power. In Jesus' name, amen. I just, um, as I was sitting there, I was thinking of the word family. And I, I know that with Tim and all of us here, we want to say welcome to this family of freedom. Welcome. That you are part of a family. It is the family of God. And Father, we just thank you that you're the God of all encouragement. You're the God who equips us. You're the God who empowers us. You're the God who releases us into all that we have. And Lord, give us an understanding of what that is generally, but actually, especially today, we just pray for Samuel that he may really know not only to be part of your family, but what it is to be part of this family, that we may see him equipped, empowered, encouraged, and everything that he needs, Lord. And Father, also that, uh, as, as Ben said, he said, Samuel, we think of Samuel of old, who said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And we do pray that he'd have years to hear what you're saying to him personally and for the youth as well of this church and the young people of this church. Father, thank you for bringing him to be part of this family. Welcome, Samuel, to the family of freedom. Bless you. Yeah, and Father, we know it's no light thing leading the youth and the children. It is such an important thing, Lord, such an important place 
such an important part in the church. And Father, we pray now for your equipping beyond measure. May even Samuel be surprised at what you will do in him and through him during the time that he's here leading the children and youth. So, Father, we, we commit him to you today, and we thank you for him, Lord. I thank you for him. Having stepped in for a short time, I realize what a commitment it is. And we pray, Lord, for that equipping for him beyond measure in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we thank you so much for bringing Samuel to us. We thank you for opening the doors over these last months. We thank you for the way you just use simple relationships in our church family to bring him to be part of our church family. Father, I pray your blessing on him, your protection, not only as he makes friends in the church, but also in our community and in our island. I pray you'd feel very much home here, whether at work or at leisure. And uh, Lord, that you'd bless his friendships that he makes. And uh, bless his family too as they see him leave the UK. But Father, we thank you so much that he is part of our family. And Lord, we want to take care of him and bless him as he blesses so many in our community here. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Samuel, um, any first words? Here we go. I thought this might happen. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's wonderful to be here, and thank you for the warm welcome I've already received from many of you. It's, it's such a fantastic opportunity to be here. That I see on the horizon many, many exciting things. What a privilege and an honor to walk alongside you as parents and to support and encourage and equip you. What an honor and a privilege to, to be part of that discipling journey of your children and your young people as they step in step into what God has for them amazing thank you Samuel brilliant good times ahead and uh, I think it's just Samuel's arrival is just another step in what we believe and are perceiving God is doing in this community right now and we are really excited I think God has got his hand on Freedom Church at the moment and this um, vision for the year, flourishing for the people of Jersey. We're just believing in every way, from every angle, we're going to start to see that um, come to fruition and reality. So we're really excited. Um, young people, we're going to ask that you stay in the service today because Phil is preaching and we're really excited to hear Phil's message. And I think he's got um, um, a sermon that is going to speak to all of us today. So young people, you're going to stay in today, but kids, um, you can head out at this point. Um, and kids team as well. Um, there's lots going on upstairs for you guys, um, which is going to be great. Um, but while they're doing that, why don't you turn around, say hi to someone that is near to you and welcome them to church.
I'm getting a thumbs up from Dan. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. Do uh, find a seat. My thesis today is that your view of the universe and the driving force behind everything ultimately determines your intentional or unintentional effectiveness in bringing flourishing to those around you. So we should have that sewn up in about 25 minutes. In other words, Tim said it last week. Tim said, uh, who we believe God to be totally impacts who, uh, how we behave. Well, my name's uh, Phil. I'm a member of the pastoral leadership team here at Freedom Church, and I am a dog person. Uh, that's a, a dog person in contrast to a mere dog owner. A dog person is someone who talks about their dog incessantly. Uh, some of you are like that with your pets too. Uh, you know what I think is a good measure of a dog person or a, or a cat person rather than just a pet owner? 70% of people with pets sign their pet's name on their Christmas card. <laughs> Who here has included their pet's name on a Christmas card? I've found my people. Um, you've heard it said that dogs look like their owners. Many years ago, Caesar Dog Food ran an ad campaign showing dogs that literally look like their owners. Um, <laughs> I don't think this is what they mean when they say that dogs look like their owners, but uh, we've had our dog, Henry, for about two and a half years, and uh, I've observed something over the past two and a half years about dogs and their owners, and that is that dogs, I believe, do look like their owners, not in the way that Caesar Dog Food was suggesting, but I think dogs look like their owners in that they imitate their owners' behaviors. Uh, take a look at this poor dog here. You need to know there is nothing wrong with this dog. <laughs> this dog is taking pity on his owner. This made the news a few years ago. They were on This Morning and interviewed by Phil and Holly. Like, this dog is just imitating his owner. <laughs> we got our dog Henry during lockdown, so we had the privilege of uh, spending a huge amount of time together in the house, which means he's very much picked up, up our personalities. And we're big softies, and he's a big softie. Henry's temperament and his character and some of his behaviors reflect ours. Now, I, I, I appreciate there are some exceptions to this rule. Clearly, there are some delightful people um, who have dogs with behavioral issues. Uh, some of you are in this room. And, uh, and I'm not saying it's a rule that applies 100% of the time, but I remember being in a car park in Trinity, and we met, I, I forget if it was one or two, shouty, aggressive, spitting, annoyed dogs, angry dogs. And the owners were like, shut up, sit down, get in the car, and then turned to me and said, I'm so sorry, we've no idea why they're like that. And I thought, I've got a fairly good idea of why they might be like that. And in contrast, I'm not saying that our dog Henry is perfect, but this was him at his daycare recently praying for one of the other dogs. Um, very holy dog. Yeah. Uh, last week we started a new series, uh, and we've adopted this vision statement. Uh, flourishing for the people of Jersey. And in this teaching series, we're looking at the grand narrative of the Bible and how it shows us that God's plan for humanity is to bring flourishing. And let's remind ourselves once more, this grand narrative of the Bible is described by the theologian N.T. Wright as a five-act play, where the creation of the world is act one, the fall of man is act two, Israel is act three, Jesus is act four, and we're playing our part in act five. So we're looking at act one at the moment. And last week, Tim talked 
about how we're made in the image of God. And in the New Testament letters, the the Apostle Paul uh, uses the language of imitating Christ. In other words, reflecting the character of God in your choices and in your behavior and in your character. So this week is not so much a, a sequel to Tim's, but more so a prequel. If George Lucas can do it with Star Wars, why can't I, right? Tim took quite a a brilliant and deep dive into our mandate as image bearers of Christ. And so if you missed that, please go back and listen on the podcast or catch up on YouTube. What I want to do this morning is zoom out and look in more detail at the nature of God. Whose image is it that we're made in? I'm aware that we're all in different points in our faith journey. Some of us are currently doing Alpha, some are exploring faith in other ways, and you may have even never opened a Bible. So I want to start by zooming right out and start with the question, what is the Bible? Because when your topic is the creation of the universe, I think it's important to ask the questions, what am I reading? Can I believe it? Can I trust it? What's the purpose of the text? And what can I learn from it. So is the Bible a history book? Is it poetry? Is it true? Or is it a story? And the answer is yes to all of those things. The Bible is a library of ancient writings written by approximately 40 people over a period of approximately 1,500 years And within those writings, you find songs, historical narrative, laws, sermons, letters. Our Bible is organized into 66 books, and the first of those books is Genesis. And the first page, chapter 1 of Genesis, is an ancient creation poem. There were lots of creation poems in the ancient world. For thousands of years, we've been telling stories to explain why things are the way they are. We're predisposed to telling stories. There's this deep human need to tell stories. And the Genesis 1 poem is one of many ancient explanations for why things are the way they are, what's important, and what we're doing here. And we've heard of others, haven't we? You You've probably heard of Zeus and the Titans, which form part of the the Greek creation story. Like if you've watched, um, what was that Disney cartoon? Hercules has got like Zeus and like all of that stuff in it. The point is there's lots of these stories from lots of different cultures. If you'll allow me, I'd like to take a brief look at one of the most popular creation stories in the ancient world that's not found in the Bible, and it's called the Enuma Elish. It's the earliest written creation story, and the story includes accounts of various gods killing each other, <laughs> killing other gods. It's quite violent. It talks about entrails, um, and it's recorded on seven tablets. And on tablet four, there's a battle between the gods Marduk and Tiamat, and Marduk kills Tiamat. And then it says this, it says, he cast down the carcass to stand upon it. He paused to view her dead body that he might divide the form and do artful works. He split her like a shellfish into two parts. Half of her he set up as a covering for heaven. And then later in this creation story, it talks about the origin of of humanity. It says, I will take the blood, that's the blood of a god. Uh, I'll take the blood and fashion bone. I will establish a savage I will, man shall be his name, truly savage man I will create. He shall be charged with the service of the gods that they might be at ease. Now, this was one of the dominant creation stories. In this creation story, human beings come into existence as an afterthought in order to serve the gods. They're created out of a god's blood, which is spilled as the result of an act of revenge against the older gods. What's the driving engine of that creation story? It's violence, carnage, and destruction. 
Why are we looking at a creation story that isn't in the Bible? I will answer that question in just a moment. But first, let's play a quiz. Firstly, hands up, how many of you grew up in Jersey? Okay, so conversely, hands up if you did not grow up in Jersey but moved here in later life. Right, depending on where you moved from, the, d- the differences in culture might have been subtle or they might have been stark. For me, moving from the UK, I didn't have to relearn much. I noticed that the traffic lights here don't have a red and amber state between red and green. They just jump straight from red to green. Whereas those of you from South Africa had to learn the name traffic lights, because in South Africa you call them robots. Right. Baffling. I was chatting with Britta Hulebeck recently. Many of you may know Britta. Say hello, Britta. Hi, Britta. Oh, well done. Yes. An ambiguous statement. Well done. Say hello, Britta. Hello. Good. Britta is American and having lived here for six or seven years, something like that, still doesn't know the names of chocolates inside a tub of celebrations. Did you know... So, well, Britta recently passed her British citizenship test. Well done. In order to pass a British citizenship test, you have to be able to answer some, frankly, insane questions. Let's have a quick quiz. I've picked three of my favourites. Question one. What did Sir Frank Whittle invent in the 1930s? Radar, hovercraft, jet engine, or ballpoint pen? By, by way of show of hands, radar? Oh, Debbie. Hovercraft? Okay. Jet engine? Oh. Ballpoint pen? A few. And the correct answer is... Jet engine. Question two. How many members does the Welsh government have? John and Jen, the pressure's on. 150? Show of hands. Oh, a couple. 120? 90? (laughs) John put his hand up because Jen put her hand up. Or 60? Oh, the room is split and the correct answer is... 60. Well done. Third and final question for our quiz. Approximately what percentage of the UK population has a parent or grandparent born outside of the UK? Show of hands for 5%. Show of hands for 10%. A few. Show of hands for 15%. Yeah, more popular. Show of hands for 20%. Oh, the majority. And the correct answer is... 10%. Oh dear, oh dear. (laughs) Looks like an alarming number of us stand to be deported. (laughs) I hope for your sake you know all the lyrics to Beautiful Jersey in order to secure your place on the island. Back to our question, why look at a creation story that's not in the Bible? Well, sometimes it's helpful to understand that in order to understand this. The Enuma Elish was a Babylonian creation story. So that stuff was common knowledge in Babylon. This is where we come from. This is why we exist. When was the book of Genesis finally assembled and edited together and compiled? When the Jews were exiled from Jerusalem and found themselves living in Babylon. The Jews find themselves living in Babylon, miles from home in a foreign culture. They don't know the names of the chocolates, and the traffic lights have got a weird name. And for some reason, they think Jersey Wonders are delicious, even though they're like unsweetened, stale yum-yums. I may be projecting. Um, The Jews are immersed in a culture which is completely alien. And the people around them have got a very foreign narrative that says who we are and what we're doing here. Their citizenship test has got questions on the Enuma Elish. Ask the average person on the street, where did we come from? What's the nature of the divine? And the answer is, well, there was a battle between the gods, Marduk and Tiamat, and Marduk split Tiamat in two, and one half became the heavens, and the other half became the earth. Violence. 
And here's the thing. The Babylonians went around conquering everybody. So the Jews find themselves immersed in this culture and confronted with this story. And it stands in contrast to their own story. They've got their own creation stories, their own historical accounts, and their own poetry. And you can imagine in this situation, in order to stay cohesive as a tribe, it becomes important to uh, assemble all of your own traditions and write them down. So they're consolidated, and the book of Genesis is finally put together. People are making decisions about what this looks like, and someone says, let's put that poem right at the beginning. And it stands in stark contrast to the Babylonian story. And so now with that background, let's read the poem that the Jews put right at the start of the book of Genesis. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And God sent the electricians to the Freedom Center, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And so it was so. And it was so, God. And it was so. God called the dry ground land. And the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then, bonus on day three, God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seeds in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. How great is that, by the way, that an ancient civilization goes, he also made the stars. Like, it looks like he just spray-painted a few dots up there. Like, if they knew what we know now, this would have a whole chapter to itself, right? God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves around in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. 
So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. I wonder what sense you get of the nature of God when you read this creation story. This God loves to make things flourish. It's good. It's very good. God creates animals that teem. It's good. And plants with seeds that make more plants and trees with fruit with seeds that make more trees. It's good. This God expresses himself in an outburst of life and creativity and flourishing. Do you get that sense? Are you with me? In the Genesis poem, God creates out of overflow. It's almost like as he moves, the creativity is spilling over and life is bursting up. You get the sense of joy in that creativity. It's good. Let's make a plant that looks like a bird and a bird that looks like a plant and an insect that looks like a leaf. Yeah, that's good. Let's make a duck-billed platypus that produces milk and lays eggs so that it can make its own custard. Yeah, it's good. There's joy and humor and delight and thrill and flourishing in this creation. Is the driving engine of the universe violence and destruction or overflowing joy and creativity and flourishing. What's your driving engine in you? Because your driving engine is most likely deeply connected with your view of God. Going back to the, the dogs for a moment, are you a shouty, aggressive dog because your God is an aggressive God? Are you limping through life because your God is broken? Or are you the joyful dog with a waggy tail because your God is a joyful God? Last week, Tim said, humanity, I think it was a quote, humanity is to be the eyes, ears, mouth, being an action of the creator God in his creation. So my challenge to us is about our image of God. Of what God do we bear the image? We are created to be co-creators with God. God spoke things into being. And in chapter 2, he has man participate in the creation project. He brings the animals to man, and he has Adam speak and name the animals. And there's this sense in which God abides by Adam's creative decisions. There's this co-creation going on. God isn't controlling. He holds all things together, but to be controlling is to be selfish and greedy. No, God is releasing. God created trees that create more trees and animals that create more animals after their kind. The whole thing is designed to make more and move beyond itself. He said to humanity, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. This creation is made for flourishing. When we're selfish and greedy, we go against the very nature of the universe. When we realize it's not about me, it's about bringing life to others and them bringing life to others, then the whole thing starts to flourish. My wife, Laura, for some reason, enjoys crochet. Another fan in the house. She likes to take a ball of wool, and then when previously a blanket didn't exist, 
suddenly a blanket does exist. Do you know why Laura enjoys crochet? Because God loves to make things. That's why you love to make things. It's why you scribble doodles in the corner of a sheet of paper. It's why you arrange your lunch on your plate in the way that you like. It's why you sign your name just the way you do with the particular pen strokes that you've chosen. It's why you started whatever business or project you're currently working on. God loves to make things, and so you love to make things. Ben shared with me recently the theologian Tim Keller's definition of work. Tim Keller says, it is rearranging the raw material of God's creation in such a way that it helps the world in general and people in particular thrive and flourish. It's a great definition. We are co-creators. I wonder what you consider to be work. Are you a baker? You're rearranging the raw material of God's creation in such a way that it helps people to flourish. Are you an accountant? You're rearranging the raw material of God's creation in such a way that it helps people flourish. Are you an artist? You're rearranging the raw material of God's creation in such a way that it helps people flourish. Design and beauty are deeply spiritual. We've had some outstanding sunsets recently, haven't we? What are they for? Nothing. The point of beauty is to be beautiful. In Genesis, this fruit is described as pleasing to the eye. It has beauty. Why? No reason. In this poem, the point of beauty is to be beautiful. Are you a doctor or a nurse? You have a deep drive to fix anything that obstructs or hinders human flourishing so that we can be true to what we're made to be. The God in whose image we are made is a God of creativity, blessing, beauty, and flourishing. And whatever you turn your hand to, you're positioned to execute your God-ordained purpose to make something with the world. You're bringing beauty or order or wisdom or structure to things, and it helps people flourish. I'm going to call up the worship team, if I may. I'd like to finish. I'd like to finish with a quote from the theologian Frederick Beekner. And he says, most of the time, we tend to think of life as a neutral kind of thing, I suppose. We are born into it one fine day, given life, and in itself, life is neither good nor bad, except as we make it so, by the way that we live it. We may make a full life for ourselves, or an empty life, but no matter what we make of it, the common view is that life itself, whatever life is, does not care one way or another any more than the ocean cares whether we swim in it or drown in it. In honesty, one has to admit that a great deal of the evidence supports such a view. But rightly or wrongly, the Christian faith flatly contradicts it. To say that God is spirit is to say that life does care, that the life-giving power that life itself comes from is not indifferent as to whether we sink or swim. It wants us to swim. It is to say that whether you call this life-giving power the Spirit of God or reality or the life force or anything else, its most basic characteristic is that it wishes us well and is at work towards that end. And all the people said, Amen. Shall we stand? Father God, it is so good to look again at this passage of Scripture and we see such creativity, such beauty, so much blessing so much overflow. And I pray that as we embrace this vision statement, as we seek to bring flourishing for the people of Jersey, that this too comes out of an overflow. 
as your image bearers, may we be so overflowing with joy and life and creativity that we can't help but flourish and cause flourishing to all those we meet in every sphere of influence and in every walk of life. In Jesus' name, amen.
a different story and so wherever you're going whatever your Monday looks like just as Phil has taught us so brilliantly this morning we carry a different story you carry God's kingdom and you are taking that with you wherever you are going from this room so don't forget what you carry this week in a world that is so often lost and broken and hurting you carry something that can help them. Don't be afraid to share it, to show others the love that Christ has shown you. Amen. Amen. As always, we will have um, our prayer ministry team will be um, my left at the back. And if you feel like something has grabbed you or you just want prayer for anything, head to that space at the back and ask for help. And there's a team there ready and willing to pray with you. But other than that, it has been fantastic to see everyone this morning. Thank you for being here. Are we putting the chairs away? Can someone give me a... It's a yes. We are putting the chairs away. Fifteen. Fifteen high. Fifteen high for the blue chairs. The yellow chairs go at the back. The grey chairs go on the rack. Nailed it. Thanks for coming, everyone. Great to see you this morning. Cheers.